Welcome back to Uncharted X. This is Ben, and I hope everyone out there is doing well. As some of you may know, I was in Peru recently on a trip along with Brian Forrester and Jimmy from the Bright Insight channel, as well as just a great group of fellow travellers. It had been quite a while since I last visited Peru, and I had a few specific objectives to investigate on this trip, one of which is the subject of today's video. It's something that challenges the established narrative of the history of this region in a very specific way. In fact, I think with some further investigation, it could be quite groundbreaking. Before we get started here, I wanted to quickly mention that my next Egypt group trip is coming up soon. It starts on October 16th of this year, 2021. I'll be joined by my friends Kyle and Russ Allen of the Brothers of the Serpent podcast. You might also know them from the several swapcasts we've done on this channel, or from Randall Carlson's great Cosmographia show. This trip has more or less been sold out for months, but given the uh, illness of unspecified origin that shall not be named, several people have had to defer or cancel. So if anyone is interested in an excellent opportunity to visit Egypt without the regular hordes of tourists, there are a few spots open. The trip focuses on several special permission accesses to various sites, and I think it's going to be a great time. So if you're interested, all of the details are on my website at unchartedx.com tour. Other than Machu Picchu, the incredible site of Sacsayhuaman is likely the most well-known of Peru's megalithic locations, and it's really not hard to see why. While it shares its iconic, polygonal, non-linear masonry style with several other locations, Sacsayhuaman is unique for the sheer scale of stonework found here. Huge blocks of a very hard form of limestone make up the iconic zigzag wall and terraces found in the hills above Cusco at nearly 12,000 feet above sea level. Some of these individual blocks weigh up to an in excess of 150 tonnes. Anyone who looks into Sacsayhuaman in any depth will find the specific origin of the stonework here to be shrouded in mystery and contradiction. Naturally, however, this mystery is dismissed by the authoritative academics and their mouthpiece known as Wikipedia. According to the archaeological mainstream, the complex was created by the Inca in the 15th century AD. Never mind that this statement is contradicted by what the Inca themselves said about the site. They never claimed to have built it. And that's not to mention that they didn't remotely have the capability to do work on this scale. Even early historians like Garcilaso de la Vega, who witnessed the Inca civilization at work here, only ever reported to have seen the Inca using extremely primitive methods to try and move some of the big stones. No levers, no wheels, just thousands of men attempting to move a large stone with ropes. Is this evidence of the Inca building the site? Or is it evidence for them repairing and restoring it? What should be abundantly obvious to anyone who is capable of using their eyeballs along with a small dab of logic is that this site, along with many other megalithic sites, was quite clearly repaired by the Inca. Note the significantly more primitive rough stonework that is always found on top of the vastly superior megalithic work. This primitive masonry was logically completed in later periods than the megalithic and is also obviously of a dramatically lower level of sophistication and technology. It seems clear to me that the Inca found these ancient megalithic sites to be both sacred and profound and they did their best to reconstruct and repair them. I think this is exactly what Garcilaso de la Vega witnessed, the Inca restoring and repairing a pre-existing megalithic structure. When you look at any of the megalithic sites of the Sacred Valley of Peru in this context, you can see the evidence for Inca repair work everywhere. Further, there is significant evidence that these sites needed repairing, as even today you can find dramatic examples of cataclysmic damage and destruction, which is perhaps another indicator of their vastly longer history than the mainstream would have us believe. If you're interested in more detail on the architectural styles of the Sacred Valley, or in a more in-depth investigation into Sacsayhuaman itself, I have dedicated videos on both of those topics, and you can find the links to them below the video in the description box. 
Let's consider the Inca civilization for a moment. One thing that has always been said about them is that, despite their size and success, they never had an organized system of writing. A simple web search will confirm this mainstream opinion. While they did have a record-keeping system consisting of knotted cords called quipu, which worked like a mnemonic device or a memory aid, this isn't the same thing as a system of writing. It is possible that even if they did have a writing system, any evidence for it may have been destroyed by the Spanish invaders, who were dedicated to erasing as much of the native culture as possible all in the name of religious zealotry with the priests and bishops cheering them on. While talking with Brian Forrester a few years ago, he suggested another possibility, one that applies to the High Inca and specifically their textiles and fabrics. In the entrance to a small museum in Cusco, you can find an example of what looks to be a quite sophisticated system of symbols that have been found embroidered onto the clothing of the High Inca. Could this system of colors and shapes perhaps be something more than a simple decoration? As far as I know, this possibility hasn't been investigated seriously, but there certainly seems like there could be more to it than just random assortments of shapes and colors. Interestingly, something similar to these patterns, particularly the dotted or stepped matrix you see here, can also be found in a few locations of ancient Egypt. The one that most comes to mind for me is in the box room of the Wenis Pyramid at Saqqara. Note a similar pattern on the walls of this room found beneath the pyramid. Could this possibly be a connection between these cultures or something that is indicative of a shared common ancestry? According to Graham Hancock's excellent book, America Before, we know that there are significant similarities between the Native American mound builder cultures and that of the ancient Egyptians. Yes, and it's, I mean, the other, the, there's other connections too that seem to come from that common ancestor. One of the things I loved about America before was the connection you made between the cultures of the mound builders and the yeah. ancient Egyptians from, you know, spiritual beliefs, religious beliefs. And then in particular, the role of the astronomer seemed to be just a Such remarkable. Astonishing, astonishing, remarkable comparisons. And, I, and I'm not suggesting that, that ancient Egyptians went to North America and passed on their <laughs> ideas to Native Americans. What I'm suggesting is that both Native American cultures and the ancient Egyptian cultures were the inheritors of a legacy from a much earlier culture that was shared and common to both and that passed down the same information in, in both places. And that's why you get these astonishing similarities, which, which otherwise simply cannot be explained. Their spiritual views of the afterlife and the role that particular stars play in it, specifically Orion's belt, along with the function and even the dress of priests involved in mortuary ceremonies is remarkably similar between the two cultures. How can this be the case, given that they are not only separated by vast distances, but also by millennia of time? Hancock doesn't suggest that there was any specific contact or direct transfer of religion between them, but rather that they are connected via way of a common ancestor culture and that these customs and beliefs are the echoing footprint of some unknown yet global civilization. This isn't the only connection between Egypt and the ancient cultures of the Americas. The Inca also share several commonalities with the dynastic Egyptians that seem to indicate the possibility that the same global culture played a role in their ancestry. The most obvious connection is, of course, the megalithic stonework itself, although I think that both cultures could have inherited much of this rather than built it themselves. They also share a remarkably similar methodology for building reed boats, in the case of the Egyptians for use on the Nile and in the case of the Inca on Lake Titicaca. Given that there is significant precedent for connections between these ancient cultures, perhaps there is something more to these symbols and shapes that we find on the clothing of the High Inca as well as on the walls of ancient Egyptian structures. Perhaps this is something that is worth some further investigation. The topic of possible Inca writing methods brings us back to Sacsayhuaman and one of my objectives for this trip, which was to find a particular block on the site that I had heard about. 
This is a unique piece that seems to show some evidence for exactly that, an ancient form of writing. The stone is colloquially known as Sherman Stone, after Sherman Osborne, a long-time history enthusiast and a supporter of my and many others' work. Sherman has been relentlessly researching and campaigning on Twitter, trying to drive awareness and interest in this particular stone. It's only through Sherman's work that I even found out about this block in the first place, and despite having spent several days at Saxe Huaman in the past, I had never seen it, so with some basic directions, I set out to find it on this last trip. The block is located on the other side of the mountain from the terraces and the zigzag wall, on the slope that heads down towards Cusco. In ancient times, Saxe Huaman would have flowed all the way down into the megalithic centre of Cusco, and it was likely all part of a single installation. You can still find some remnants of this original work here and there. On a past trip, for example, Brian Forrester showed us a beautiful example located in the backyard of a small boutique hotel that's halfway up the mountainside towards Saxe Huaman. Got there. I guess. Let's go. Go ahead, Ildi. I'll go behind you. Colonial Spanish with concrete. And then megalithic. Wow, this is amazing, huh? Yeah, I didn't even know this was here. This hotel is near the modern plaza of San Cristobal, which in Inca times was Manco Capac's palace, which he rebuilt from the damaged remnants of the megalithic structures that were originally here. You might not immediately recognize the style of this wall as being part of Saxe Huaman, as when most people think of the stonework of that site, they think of the iconic and massive zigzag walls. In reality, the style of the stonework at Saxe Huaman changes as you get towards the top of the hill that it's all built around. The terraces and the zigzag wall are made up from those flowing gigantic blocks of limestone that seem to have no straight lines. Yet, as you progress up the terraces towards the top of the mountain, the megalithic work switches over to andesite, and the blocks become smaller and more linear, although still precise in their joinery. The Inca seem to have gone to great lengths in order to repair and rebuild both styles of work. This more square and linear style is very similar to the masonry of the Corricancha and the wall that we found in the backyard of the boutique hotel. As a consequence of their straight lines and smaller size, these blocks of andesite were extremely popular as building materials for the Spanish invaders, and many of the colonial structures and the churches of Cusco are made up of literally thousands of these megalithic blocks that were originally sourced from Saxe Huaman. Sherman Stone is also one such block of andesite, and it is found in an off-limits area, requiring you to step over one of the dreaded ropes of no access lest you be tooted at by a whistle guard. Thankfully, we weren't being shadowed by them at this particular moment, and I was able to take a good long look at the block. It certainly seems to me that there was a detailed carving originally on the face of this stone, and it's hard to say that it doesn't resemble some form of writing. I've heard it suggested that it could be something similar to Rongo Rongo, which is the system of glyphs that is used on Easter Island, but with the erosion on this block, it's really hard to tell. One thing is certain, however, and that is that this is a unique piece, and it deserves to be investigated more thoroughly by those in mainstream archaeology in the position to do so. At the very least, a detailed rubbing or analysis of its surface could help to clear up the details. I did manage to make a LiDAR scan of the stone, and perhaps a more thorough rendering and investigation in an application like Blender might help to reveal more. The scan does give some depth to the model, and allows us to do some basic metrology, at least within the bounds of the LiDAR scanner that comes on Apple products. Whilst in Peru, I made 3D scans of a number of artifacts and structures, which I'll go through and share in a bit more detail in an upcoming video. I will be making these models available as downloads for channel members and supporters, so if you're interested, please do check out the support page on my website for more details. 
Whilst I was examining Sherman Stone at Saxe Huaman, I was struck with its similarity to another block that I recalled seeing at Tiwanaku, that enigmatic site on the southern side of Lake Titicaca in Bolivia. That is a stone that we labelled the superblock at the time for the depth of features that it contains. Found behind the pyramid known as the Acapana, the superblock is also made from andesite, but it has a whole host of interesting elements. The back of this block is noticeably curved and smooth, quite a rare occurrence amongst the many 90 degree angles and straight lines that generally characterise the work of Tiwanaku and Pumapunku. When I see this shape, I can't help but think it's something like a sluice gate, or had something to do with water originally. It just seems like it's hydrodynamic. On its front side, the block is festooned with tiny little drill holes, something that you can also find in several places on this site, noticeably on this andesite piece at Pumapunku, but also in some of the larger sandstone blocks. The element that most connects it to Sherman's stone at Saxe Huaman, at least for me, is the obvious remnants of some sort of engraving or writing that's also found on this block. Again, there seems to be a high degree of erosion that has obscured the original shapes. One does wonder just how much erosion can occur on hard stone like this that was supposedly carved but only four or five hundred years ago. Coming back to Saxe Huaman and this interesting block, although it's the only one of its type that I know of on this site, it's entirely possible that there were once many more just like it. I've heard vague reports of similar stones being found in the backfill behind some of the megalithic walls, but I don't have any solid data on this. The fact that some of these walls even have backfill is an interesting topic all of its own, as in some places, this backfill consists of megalithic blocks. I've seen these megalithic blocks in backfill myself in the past, although unfortunately today all of these areas, which are mostly on the upper terraces, are now off limits to the public for whatever reason. The fact that there are megalithic blocks in the backfill at all is solid evidence for the repair and rebuilding that occurred on this site. You simply wouldn't go to the effort of shaping and creating megalithic stones, only to then use them in backfill. But if you were trying to rebuild a site and you couldn't find the original location for a block, then you would reuse it in whatever way that you could. There are many examples of this type of reuse of megalithic blocks by the Inca, be it as backfill in places like Saxe Huaman, or something like inserting a large megalithic block as a lintel over alcoves or doorways. One just has to wander around the streets of Cusco with their eyes open in order to see many such examples. All in all, Sherman Stone is an intriguing element of the mystery of Saxe Huaman, and I was pleased to be able to track it down and share it with you all here today. Any way you cut it, this stone is a real challenge for our current story of the history of this region. Did the Inca in fact have a writing system? Or is this stone a remnant from an earlier culture and if so, what could they have inscribed onto this block? Only more investigation and study will be able to move us closer to the truth. I want to give out a couple of quick recommendations and shout outs before I wrap up this video. Congratulations to the History with Kaylee channel for passing 10,000 subs. Kaylee makes excellent videos. I'd really recommend checking out her recent work looking into Doggerland and I very much enjoyed her collaboration with Johanna James and the links to those videos are below. Also, my friend Ancient Sanctum has produced her first video, a very informative and balanced look at Gunaya Sharia, a fascinating and possibly megalithic site in Russia. I've been interested in this site for ages, I get asked about it all the time, but data on it is really hard to come by. So if you're interested, please do check out the video and drop Ancient Sanctum a sub. Thank you all for watching. I do hope you found this interesting. I am working on other content from my recent trip to Peru, and I look forward to catching you all in the next one. Cheers.